Now, James Hutton lived in the late 1700s. James wrote a book and said the earth is millions of years old. Now, you need to understand, in the late 1700s, most people believed the Bible, or at least they were strongly influenced by Christianity, and everybody thought the earth was about 6,000 years old. That was the common teaching of the day. Okay? They taught the kids in the public school, you know, God created the world in six days, like we saw earlier. So back when everybody thought the earth was a few thousand years old, James Hutton came along and said, oh, no, it's lots older than that. And it got here by uniformitarianism. Ooh, kids, big word, bold print. That'll be on the test. They always are, okay? Uniformitarianism means the present is the key to the past. James Hutton's book that he wrote had a real strong influence on a young lawyer from Scotland named Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell, the lawyer, hated the Bible. Somebody calculated one time that if all the lawyers in the world were laid end to end around the equator, we would all be better off. <laughs> Charles Lyell, in 1830, wrote this book right here, Principles of Geology. I've got it here on the table. You can come take a look at it. It's all marked up. In this book, you can see his hatred for the Bible kind of ooze off every page. He kept calling it ancient doctrines. He said, oh, you have a scriptural authority. He was mocking them, okay? He called it a religious prejudice. He said, men of superior talent, oh, he's talking about himself, who thought for themselves and were not blinded by authority, he used every opportunity he could find to mock the scriptures. And kids, you won't have to go to college very far before you're going to run into a professor that has this mocking attitude toward God's Word. How many of you had one when you went through school? Seems like their whole goal in life is to destroy your faith. I had a bunch of them when I went to school. <laughs> they just wanted to destroy your confidence. Well, Charles said his goal was to free the science from Moses. What do you suppose he meant by that? Well, before Charles Lyell wrote his book, everybody looked at the geology, looked at Grand Canyon and said, wow, look at the flood did. He didn't like people interpreting Earth's history in light of the Bible. He wanted them to interpret Earth's history in terms of millions of years. Lyell is the primary guy responsible for inventing what today is known as the geologic column. How many have ever heard of the geologic column before? They divided the Earth up into layers and gave them names, you know, uh, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, all that kind of stuff. Maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park, named after the Jurassic layer, okay? Each layer of rock was given a name and an age and an index fossil. Now keep in mind, all this was done in 1830 before there ever was a carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating, lead 208, lead 206, uranium 235, uranium 238. None of those had even been thought of. So they didn't determine these great ages by any radiometric metric decay method. They just picked the numbers out of the clear blue sky. It's a fact the earth has many layers of sedimentary rock. That is just a fact. You can see them all over Tennessee here. How'd they get there? Well, there are two interpretations. One group says the layers formed slowly over millions of years. The other group says, no, these layers are all from the flood in the days of Noah. And again, they're always trying to erase that line between the two and make their interpretation become part of the fact. And it's just not, okay? It's just their interpretation, that's all. The geologic column is actually the Bible for the evolutionist. The only place you'll ever find it is in the textbooks. It doesn't exist. This guy admits it. He said, if there were a column of sediments, uh, unfortunately, no such column exists. Did you know there is no geologic column? If there was, it'd be 100 miles thick. It doesn't exist. It's one of the lies in the textbooks. And actually, all of evolution is based on this lie right here. This is one of the most serious ones, in my opinion. It's true the earth has layers. That's not the question. Okay? How did they get there, though? I mean, if that layer sat there for 10 million years waiting for the next one, don't you think it's going to rain once in a while in 10 million years? Why are there no erosion marks between the layers? Why are they stacked on top of each other just like a stack of pancakes? Hmm? And by the way, why are there no soil layers between the rock layers? I mean, soil builds up on top of rock. Don't you think there'd be some soil built up once in a while? Hmm? Look, if you get a jar of dirt and rocks and gravel and sand and mud and shake it up and set it down, it settles into layers for you in a few minutes. It doesn't take long. How many have seen those things you buy at the mall with two pieces of glass and different colored sand in between? You know, you flip it over and it makes all kinds of layers just in a few seconds. It doesn't take long. I was preaching years ago in Union Center, South Dakota. Now, Union Center is right there. It's not even on the map.
And South Dakota puts everything they can find on the map just to kind of fill in the white places, you know. Well, there were 40 people in the whole town. 38 of them came to church. The other two must have been pulling a calf, I reckon. I don't know. But boy, we had a great meeting, and the preacher said, Hey, Hovind, let's go down to Rapid City. They've got a bunch of dinosaurs in the museum there. I said, All right, I like dinosaurs. Let's go. So we all drove down to Rapid City. We came to this museum, and a guide met us at the door. He said, Hey, folks, would you like me to give you a tour? We said, That would be great, sir. Well, the first place we stopped on the tour was the geologic time chart. They have it lit up, and it's behind glass, and it's holy and sacred. Don't dare touch that thing, you know. So we're standing over there, and the guide said, Now, folks, this layer of rock right here is about 70 million years old. And it's so cool, because they always get that sanctimonious tone in their voice, you know. 70 million years old. Oh. <laughs> well, my daughter was 12 years old at the time. She raised her hand. She said, Mister, how do you know that layer is 70 million years old? He said, Honey, that's a good question. We tell the age of the layers by what types of fossils we find in them. They're called index fossils. And by the way, that's correct. That's what the textbook says. Scientists use index fossils to determine the age of rock layers. She said, Thank you, sir. We walked around the other side. We're standing over here, and the guide said, Now, folks, these bones are about 100 million years old. My daughter raised her hand again. She said, Sir, how do you know those bones are 100 million years old? He said, Well, honey, we tell the age of the bones by which layer they came from. She said, uh, Sir, when we were standing over there, you told me you knew the age of the layers by the bones, and now you're telling me you know the age of the bones by the layers. She said, Isn't that circular reasoning? I thought, Wow, a chip off the old block. <laughs> that guy had the strangest look on his face. It was almost as if he were thinking. He looked at my daughter. He looked at me. I wasn't about to help him. I thought, wow, this is going to be good. I have got to hear this. He looked back at my daughter. He said, wow, you're right. That is circular reasoning. He said, I never thought of that before. That fellow drove 50 miles one way that night to, hear me come, to come hear me speak in Union Center, South Dakota. The crowd swelled to 39. We set up a chair in the aisle. Afterwards, he talked to me for an hour. He said, Hovind, is everything I believe about geology wrong? I teach this stuff at the college. I said, oh, no, 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 I like geology. I've got a huge fossil collection, rock collection, mineral collection. I teach earth science. I love studying geology. I said, but as far as the layers being different ages, I said, yes, sir, I'm sorry. That is all baloney. It's based on circular reasoning. I'll show you. Here's a textbook that tells the kids to date the rocks by the fossils. And on the very next page, it says date the fossils by the rocks. On the next page, and they don't catch it. It's a lie. It's circular reasoning. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. Hmm. It cannot be denied from a strictly philosophical standpoint. Geologists are arguing in a circle. The relative ages of rocks are determined by the organisms they contain. They, they date the rocks by the fossils and the fossils by the rocks. Ever since the beginning of the 19th century, Fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. They don't date fossils by potassium argon dating or carbon dating. That's not how they do it. Radiometric dating would not even be possible if the geologic column had not been erected first. There's no way simply to look at a fossil and say how old it is unless you know the age of the rocks it comes from. This is Niles Eldridge, one of the most famous evolutionists alive today. He said, and this poses something of a problem. Yeah, something poses a big problem, Niles. If we date the rocks by the fossils, how can we then turn around and talk about patterns of evolutionary change through time in the fossil record? Circular reasoning. This guy said, the rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. <laughs> I think the cheese done fell out of his sandwich. That's what I think. Okay, he's... He's a few fries short of a Happy Meal. Mm -hmm. It's based on circular reasoning, okay? This guy said the charge of circular reasoning can be handled several ways. It can be ignored is not the proper concern of the public. It can be denied by calling down the law of evolution. It can be admitted as a common practice or avoided by pragmatic reasoning. But it is all based on circular reasoning. Actually, at the Scopes Monkey Trial, 1925, over here in Dayton, Tennessee. How far is Dayton from here, Steve? About 100 miles. 100 miles, okay. 
This is what they were going to use as evidence for evolution. The lowest layers are obviously the oldest. Page 275 of the court transcript. No, the oldest layers are not obviously the oldest. Did you know in still water, sediment layers settle out the bottom one first, and then the second one, and then the third one? That's correct. But in moving water, you can get five or six or ten layers to form simultaneously. They form from one end and travel across. So it's possible to have a fossil on the bottom that is younger than a fossil on top if it's moving water. There's a great video tape called Experiments in Stratification. It covers all that if you want more on that. Or get our video number six. We'll get more of that later. I like to ask evolutionists. I say, guys, your geologic column contains limestone uh, quite a few places. If I handed you a piece of limestone, how would you know if it's 100 million year old Jurassic limestone or 600 million year old Cambrian limestone? I mean, exactly what's the difference? They'd say, well, the only way to tell the difference is by the index fossils. Uh, that's precisely my point. They date the layers by the fossils. This textbook shows the kids a trilobite. And it says, boys and girls, trilobites make good index fossils. If a trilobite is found in a rock layer, the rock layer probably formed 500 to 600 million years ago. I don't think so. Somebody found a human shoe print where the guy with a shoe on had stepped on and smashed a trilobite. They asked evolutionists all over, how on earth could a human step on a trilobite? If trilobites lived 500 million years ago and man didn't get here till, you know, 3 million years ago and they didn't start, didn't start wearing shoes till 10,000 years ago, how could a human step on a trilobite? One atheist said, well, it's obviously. The uh, only answer would be that uh, aliens visited the planet 500 million years ago. <laughs> oh, them aliens will do it every time. <laughs> Another guy said, well, maybe there was a large trilobite shaped like a shoe that fell on a small one. Now, there are some big trilobites, okay, but I don't think they're shaped like a shoe. Actually, the trilobite has the most complicated eyeball ever. Trilobite eyes are unbelievable. And this is one of the first creatures to evolve, and it already has the most complex eye, which it, just the eye is one of the most complex features you could have. Now, trilobites are not index fossils for anything, okay? There are all kinds of different types of trilobites, and there probably are some still alive today. Certainly, the Baltic isopod is still alive. A guy sent me a couple weeks ago, about a couple months ago, I guess, a whole jar full of trilobites from the Prudhoe Bay uh, treatment, water treatment plant up there for the oil uh, um, factory they've got, oil refining uh, rig. When they arrived in Pensacola, Florida, they were still alive in the jar. But I don't know how to keep a trilobite alive. I mean, you know, you give it mouth to what, you know, some resuscitation, but they all died, but we got them in our museum there. Somebody just sent me a large one that they got down in the Caribbean, about this big, it's in our museum, and it's, it was frozen. They said, yeah, I pulled it off the rock myself down in the Caribbean, still alive. They call it some kind of roach. Roach, it looks like a big trilobite. This textbook shows the kids a graptolite. It says, boys and girls, this is 410 million years old. I don't think so. Graptolites were found still alive in the South Pacific 10 years ago. So if you find graptolite, you can't use that as an index fossil for any age rock, okay? They tell the kids in school the lobe-finned fish is the index fossil for Devonian, 325 million years old. See that short leg, boys and girls? He's got a little bitty leg and then the fin. Ah, see, that proves he's evolving from a leg to a fin. No, that's a lie. The lobe-finned fish are still alive today. They're swimming around the Indian Ocean. And when they caught the first one in 1938, the scientists looked at it and said, wow, would you look at that? They survived for 325 million years. <laughs> it never dawned on them once to question the geologic column. That thought never crossed their brain. You don't question the geologic column. It is holy and sacred. You just have to say it survived for 325 million years. It's in the textbooks today. And they still say it's the index fossil for 325 million year old rock, even though they know they're swimming around the ocean. How can they be that dumb? This lady wrote a book about it, A Fish Caught in Time. She says, boys and girls, this is our own great uncle, 40 million times removed. She does look a little fishy, you know, kind of around the gills there. Okay. <laughs> You're going to be told that dinosaurs are index fossils for the Jurassic period, 70 million, or Cretaceous, 70 million years ago. That's baloney. Dinosaur bones were found here recently that had blood cells still in them. How long are the blood cells going to last? Here's soft tissue found with dinosaur bones. Still flexible, soft tissue in March of 2005. 
There's fossilized human hands found in the same rock strata as dinosaur bones. Now, they tell you the layers are different ages. That's simply baloney, okay? Now, Charlie Darwin didn't like round numbers. So he said the Weldon deposits are 306,662,400 years old. <laughs> oh, how could he possibly know such a thing, okay? All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting these different rock layers. Petrified trees standing up. Now, how long does a dead tree stand up around here before it falls down? Hmm, five years, maybe ten years? Five million? Oh, no, not five million, that's for sure, right? But yet petrified trees in the vertical position are found all over the planet. I'll just flash through some pictures real quick here. There are all kinds of petrified trees found standing up. And they're running through multiple layers, and the kids are being taught the layers are different ages, and yet here's one tree connecting them all. I'm having a hard time believing these layers are different ages. That's what I'm having. Central Alabama's got a large coal mine with a whole bunch of petrified trees standing up running through two seams of coal, the Blue Creek and the Mary Lee. Now, they're going to tell you in school, for coal to form, a forest has to grow, and then it all falls over and turns into a swamp, and then it gets buried, and then new mud washes in on top, and the coal slowly, or coal slowly forms from the forest that was buried. And then thousands of years later, another forest grows on top, and a whole new layer of coal form. So if you find two layers of coal, oh, that took thousands of years. That's what they'll tell you in school. That's simply baloney. We'll cover more on coal formation on video six, but if you look at the samples of trees found in this coal mine, you look at sample A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I mean, any freshman law student could tell you, hey, folks, I think I can prove these two coal formations formed at the same time, very quickly, within a few weeks or months of each other, that's for sure, probably during the flood and the days of Noah. We'll cover more on that on video six. In Cookville, Tennessee, how far is Cookville from here? 100 miles? What's that? 150 miles. In Cookville, Tennessee, there's a coal mine with petrified trees standing, running. Here's coal at the bottom. The tree is coalified at the bottom, petrified in the middle, and coalified on top, where it went through a second coal seam. Same tree. By the way, why are coal seams generally found on top of layers of rock or clay? Wouldn't it uh, be a pretty poor place to grow a forest? Ought to be on top of soil, don't you think? Yeah. Polystrate fossils are found all over the world. In uh, no Joggins, Nova Scotia, there are dozens of petrified trees standing up, connecting different rock layers. People, scientists go up there and look at them and just say, wow, that's, that's curious. <laughs> no, it's more than curious. It's devastating to your teaching that the layers are different ages. There's a brochure you can get from our uh, bookstore. It's $2. It's got 30-some pictures of color pictures of petrified trees in the vertical position. Occasionally, the petrified trees are found upside down running through many rock layers. Now we really got a problem. <laughs> I've thought about this till my brain hurts. The evolutionists have two ways to solve this. They can say, well, Hoven, you know, the trees stood upright for millions of years while the layers formed around them. Or the trees grew through hundreds of feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. Uh, there's a third way to look at it. You know, maybe they were all buried in a big flood. Mm -hmm. How fast was that calf going? Keep that thought in mind, okay? <laughs> Mount St. Helens blew thousands of trees into Spirit Lake. Lots of those trees are stuck in the mud at the bottom of Spirit Lake. They're going to petrify in the standing position. More on video six about that. So kids, when they tell you the layers are different ages, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're confused or they're lying. It is not correct. Those layers all form, nearly all of them, at the time of Noah's flood. 80 to 85% of Earth's surface does not even have three geologic periods appearing in correct consecutive order.